For more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new issue of the People's Health Dispatch. Uh, today, we are here with Gargia from the People's Health Movement Secretariat. Uh, Gargia has been part of a team following the recent meeting of the WHO's executive board uh, at the end of January. So the WHO, as uh, the UN's health agency, meets twice a year. Uh, it meets once in January or February, where uh, when its executive board first takes up some of the agenda points that are then reflected uh, during the World Health Assembly, usually held uh, in May. And so uh, this time the EB met after two years since the WHO has declared uh, COVID-19 a public health emergency. And so to begin with, Gargea, I was wondering if you could reflect on that point. Uh, what were the topics taken up by the EB and how did it reflect on two years of the, of the pandemic? Thanks, Anna. Uh, first, I'll start with the issues around uh, health emergency and the COVID issues because uh, as you have already uh, rightly said, uh, it's the second year uh, from the time the pandemic has been, I mean, uh, COVID has been declared as a public health emergency. And what we see that even uh, after two years, what we face is not, uh, uh, at the start, you know, two years back, it was an issue of science where we really did not know much about the virus. We did not know much about how to deal with it, what sort of medicines we require, what sort of vaccines we require. But two years later, the progress as far as scientifically is concerned has uh, gone ahead very well. And you'll see that, uh, you know, despite all the progress, what we face now is a gross inequity in the way uh, these products of science have been distributed. And uh, in these two years, we have seen countries uh, you know, have different waves of uh, uh, the COVID pandemic. We had uh, the variants, as we already know, there was a Delta variant and the latest one, Omicron. So this meeting was also happening in the backdrop of Omicron variant and the related surge in cases across the world. But it looks like there is very little that we have uh, uh, progressed because there are populations which are taking three doses uh, on one, I mean, they are taking booster doses on one side and there are populations which are yet to get uh, even the first dose. What is the role of WHO in this? Is the failure of actually taking the ownership of this manufacturing and distribution. As you might know, the act, uh, coordination of manufacturing, of building together these medical products was kind of taken out of WHO in the form of a large uh, multi-stakeholder or we can call it a public-private partnership known as uh, ACT Accelerator. And in that in particular, there is something known as COVAX facility, which was looking after you know, the vaccine productions and distributions across the world. And there has been this spectacular failure, which uh, after, you know, uh, after two years, there is a complete failure of these public-private partnerships in, uh, uh, you know, uh, rising up to the occasion. And why does this happen is at the core uh, problem is the WHO uh, over a period of time has become a very weak agency. And like every other United Nations organization, it has been having fund cuts. It has been having uh, you know, issues of uh, trying to delegitimize WHO uh, in uh, different ways of, let us say, saying that WHO might be inefficient and so on and so forth. And this uh, also got uh, exag uh, exaggerated with Trump trying to pull out of uh, uh, WHO and only last year did the US administration come back into WHO. Uh, I mean, they really did not leave, but uh, the decision was taken to not leave. So you have in this context, a very weak WHO. And uh, as you, the one of the core issues or the core works of WHO is to coordinate these health emergencies and you know these global health emergencies which are affecting multiple countries and coordinate them and get uh, you know policies across that help each other but what we see here is also the learnings of the pandemic uh, are, are being taken in a different way instead of actually strengthening 
the WHO and also uh, the learnings of the pandemic, which are basically that we really need a public sector and you know public health, which is provided by the governments. You know, we are seeing this across the world. Uh, just because a country, country spends a lot on health doesn't really mean uh, it was able to deal with the uh, emergency. Well, a clear example is the United States, which has been failing miserably on various fronts. So it is in this context that this is happening. But what is happening is uh, not just a few countries, but many countries uh, have not been uh, using this uh, these learnings from the pandemic to strengthen the process of a multilateral or a UN-led uh, agency like WHO, but they are weakening. How they are weakening it is, uh, you know, there is this fragmentation of decision-making uh, that is happening. So one of those in particular in this EB was the, you know, proposal by Austria where they wanted a standing committee on pandemic emergency preparedness and response. So what you know, and there are many such committees. Actually, you open the agenda or the, you know, follow the uh, executive board or the World Health Assembly. Even for someone like me who follows it on a regular basis, it's so confusing with so many parallel committees running and so on. What you increasingly see is in the name of efficiency and doing it better, uh, the, a typical corporate playbook is being employed here where things are being fragmented so much that no single person or no single agency can be confident of proposing uh, real uh, uh, you know, suggestions or making real changes. And this in particular, in the context of a health emergency in the future will be devastating because you can't have 10 different uh, committees within WHO doing 10 different things. And not just in WHO, there are multiple uh, smaller organizations like World Bank and CEPI and so on and so forth who follow uh, and have their own, uh, you know, influence on uh, these issues. So we are looking at basically a corporatized, multiple corporations, philanthropies, getting into health emergencies and the governance of it. Okay. And of course, what we have seen over the past two years, uh, I think also it reflects to what you just said, is that the WHO had a much more prominent role in the media uh, since the pandemic started. And this has uh, had a lot to do with what uh, the Director General Tedros has been doing. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, this is the year when Tedros first term is about to, about to end. So has the EB been discussing that as well? Yes. So uh, Dr. Tedros, I mean, uh, over the last few, few years, uh, because of the interest on World Health Organizations, its director general, you know, Tedros has become a very common name even beyond the health circles. Those, who and he's coming to end of his first term, which has been to an extent a uh, uh, successful one as far as you know the mainstream understanding is concerned, because you have uh, uh, the agency dealing with a pandemic, which or or a health emergency of such a scale that it hasn't seen from the day of its formation. So on one side, you have the director general or the leadership actually trying to pull through the pandemic, but how effective has the leadership been is not a, a single issue of leadership alone. It's also the organization uh, itself becoming weak and it's got a lot to do with the kind of funding it has been come, uh, getting. I'll go into that point of funding in a while. Uh, but about the leadership, so usually, uh, you know, uh, there. Ha I mean, usually, second term is, uh, let's say, a given uh, until and unless something really has gone wrong in the uh, World Health Organization. But here we don't see, and it looks like all the countries were very, uh, very much satisfied with the leadership of uh, uh, Tedros. Uh, uh, and it looks like, I mean, the executive board proposed his name already as the next director, which will be getting, going to the World Health Assembly in May, and formally he will go on to his second term. So as far as Tedros is concerned, it's been a uh, successful term for him, uh, but the structural issues still remain, you know, the structural issues of funding, the structural issues of a weak WHO, and so on remain. And uh, one thing, uh, 
uh, on a different note is also that uh, except Ethiopia, which is the actual country that he was coming him, uh, no one had comments against him. Against him. So this was coming from some of the internal conflict. So we are looking at a very strange situation where the country is not supporting him, where he comes from, but the rest of the world is. And it's got to do with some of the internal politics, which is very complex for us to understand, but he will be going through for his next term. And coming to the issue of uh, WHO and its financing. So uh, for those who might, uh, on, uh, for those who might not know, WHO actually gets uh, quality funding, uh, which is like core funding, we call it as assessed. It is good quality funds, which actually allows the World Health Organization, like any other UN agency, to work on what are the important things of the day uh, in the context of health and global health and so on. Uh, but then we have another type of funding, which basically is tied funding, and we call it as uh, voluntary funding, where you can uh, the donor country or donor agency can basically say, you know, I want you to work on X, Y, Z. So what you see is despite the uh, pandemic, you actually don't, uh, uh, don't see a great increase in funding for WHO for the next two years. Like uh, the WHO funds are decided once every two years. And the last two years, which is 2020 and 2021, we actually saw uh, around 10, I mean, nine to $10 billion come in for WHO. Most of it going, of course, for COVID related work. That's, that was very important. And what we were, uh, thinking was that, you know, because of uh, the health emergency, in the future also uh, WHO will get much needed funds. However, we see that the projections seem to be around $6 billion. There has been a discussion in the last two years, uh, which has become part of a larger uh, working group, which, say, which has been that proposed by Germany and others, uh, that uh, we need to increase the funding financing for the World Health Organization over a period of time. And for this, uh, from last one year, we have been having a working group that is looking at sustainable financing. But the irony, uh, I mean, the discussion was about how we uh, bring up the, and I was, like I was telling, the funds are basically tied and untied funds. And these untied funds are what are the good quality ones. And this committee was trying to uh, uh, make countries uh, agree that they will actually give at least half of WHO's funding as untied and quality funds. And it looks like most of the countries, mainly from the West and also a few from the global South, were not really ready to support this proposal that we want to increase uh, quality funds towards the World Health Organization. So what does, what does this mean for the organization is that the organization then goes and makes uh, ties with uh, agencies like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations and different uh, philanthropies and corporates who, when they fund something, have a very different understanding of health and they see it more as an issue of the market rather than a, uh, from the angle of rights. Uh, I, I mean, one of the classical examples is Bill Gates saying that, you know, I don't believe that we should wave off intellectual property on uh, the medical products like vaccines because the global south really doesn't have uh, the manufacturing capacity to uh, make their own uh, vaccines. And this is also something that how does this external funding from these agencies uh, uh, work on WHO's uh, technical work? and also the policy suggestions it is going to give. So we as People's Health Movement have been worried over the past many years that uh, dependence on these external funds and the private sector, the corporates, is going to weaken the uh, realistic uh, suggestions that a World Health Organization should give, which should be cutting across profits and cutting up, you know, putting people's lives over profits and not go into the understanding the trade, they need to kind of also bother about the trade and profits of the uh, corporates. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a tricky thing we are facing and we hope uh, that the countries come back to financing WHO adequately. Thank you, Gargia.
I think this has been quite a complete summary uh, of uh, the main points of the EB. Uh, of course, there have been other topics taken up, which we hope that we will uh, be elaborating upon uh, in the next issues of People's Health Dispatch. So uh, keep following us to get more information on those. Uh, and that's a wrap, I think. Thanks. Thank you.